Our brand new series, as Pastor Omar said, is a sure hope how Christmas shines through darkness. And the reason why that theme, uh, series theme is important is because if you think of those two words, sure, hope, um, well, when you hear the word sure, you know it's sure, 100% guaranteed. But many times in our culture, when you hear the word hope, it's not always sure because we say, well, I hope I can get this. I hope my bonus is coming. Or will you come to my birthday party? Well, I hope to be there. And usually when people say something like, I hope to be there, it's almost like saying, uh, don't count on me, you know? So, but in this manner, when we say a sure hope, it's almost like a redundancy. And it's sure on the one hand, and in the Bible, when you hear the word or read the word hope, it is something absolutely sure because it is backed up by the character and the promises and the word of God. And the reason why the subtext says how Christmas shines through darkness is the truth is we are living in dark times. Globally speaking, nationally speaking, people are saying, you know, business is so hard, etc. And even on a personal basis, there are many people who, for one reason or another, and you might be one of them, you listening online, you present here, you may be going through dark times yourself. And so as we begin this series, we need to be reminded that there is a sure hope. But that sure hope is in nothing that the world offers. That sure hope is not in CCF. That sure hope is in Jesus. He is our only sure hope. So that is the whole, I guess, launching pad for this new series. So as we, just before we get into our message, let me ask you, when you were very, very young, did you have like a dream for yourself? Did you have like some kind of a, a daydream, like someday I will be, for example, just like these kids over here, a doctor, a nurse, a pilot, an architect, a stewardess. Did, did you guys have, no, nobody? Yes. Yeah, I'm sure you did. Yeah, like for me, for me, the thing was like when I was about four or five, I wanted to be a cowboy. A cowboy, yeah, that's me at five years old with my pretend Winchester with my six shooters. Yeah, you didn't want to mess with me when I was five years old. As a matter of fact, we had a sign outside our house that said, beware of child. Well, it's a good thing I grew up. But seriously, what about today? Do you still have a dream? Or are you just going from day to day, hoping that life will get better, hoping that maybe the problems will go away? Maybe you're just existing, as I said, from one day to the next. Well, the character we're going to study this afternoon, and this Christmas series will, will look at the profile of many characters involved in the Christmas story, and we'll be learning lessons from their lives. The person whom we will look at today, uh, she will teach us that God can take an ordinary person and make that person's life extraordinary. That God can take someone who may feel like a nobody and that nobody will become somebody. Not in the eyes of the world, but in the eyes of God. And so I'm really excited to share with you about what we can learn from this person. But before we do that, let me rewind the clock, maybe 2,700 years. In Isaiah chapter seven, there was a prophecy that said, therefore, the Lord himself will give you, meaning the Israelites, the Jewish people, will give you a sign, behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son. Now that by itself, you and I know, is a biological, physiological impossibility that a virgin will be with child. But it was very specific. 
700 years before the birth of Jesus, the prophecy was already made. A virgin will be with child and bear a son, not a daughter, I'm sorry, a son. And she will call his name Emmanuel. By the way, do you know what Emmanuel means? Yeah, literally translated, it is uh, with us is God. Because the L part here is the God part. With us is God. But God with us is okay. Now, what is the significance of this prophecy in the lives of the typical Jewish woman from the time the prophecy was made all the way even up to the time before Jesus was born? Well, the impact was this. Almost every Jewish woman had it as her dream, as her ambition to be married, to have children, to have male children, to be specific, because maybe one of those male children will be the Messiah. That was their dream. Wow, wouldn't it be cool if I became the mother of the promised Messiah? Amazing. The only problem there is that it would only happen to one person. It's like winning the lottery. Well, the lottery is what we call it now, right? During my days, it was sweepstakes. Does anybody remember sweeps? No? Yeah, some of you? Some of you? Okay. I know your grandfather told you about it. Anyway, so it's like hitting the lottery. So it, it's, it's really sad when a lot of people dream, but only one person can have the dream come true. It's something like this movie. You, some of you may remember this. The movie is It Could Happen to You. Uh, it starred a very young Nicolas Cage and Bridget Fonda. And it's supposed to be a true story. So the policeman goes into a, a coffee shop and after having a meal, has no money to tip the waitress. And so he says, half jokingly, I guess, he says, you know what, I have a lottery ticket and if I win, it's $4 million. If I win, I'll split the winnings with you. Of course, in his mind, he would never win, right? Because it's a lottery. But the thing is, he won. Anyway, you can watch the movie for the rest of the story. But today, we're gonna talk about an amazing young lady. An amazing young lady whose example we should follow, whose character we should emulate and whom we should look upon with tremendous respect and admiration. Her name is Mary. Now, Mary, as you know, and as the scripture reading uh, said, she was the young girl that God chose to bear his son, Emmanuel. And Mary was living in very dark times. This was the time when the Jews were under Roman domination and a lot of them were impoverished. Obviously, they were very oppressed. And they were wondering, when will this Messiah come? Because in the back of their minds, the, the liberty, the mission, the liberty that the Messiah will bring and the mission that he will accomplish would be to liberate them from Roman domination. That was all they could think of. But you and I know, looking back, that God had far bigger plans for his son, Jesus. But what can we learn from the life of Mary? The title of today's message is Merry Christmas. And if Mary were here today, she will tell you and me, Christmas is all about my son. Christmas is not about me. Christmas is about Jesus. And the action point, the response that you and I should have to the example of Mary is this. Receive Jesus, God's sure hope. That would be her message to you and me if she were here today. Now, there are three things that we can actually learn from the scripture reading, not only what was read by Pastor Omar, but what we will read thereafter. Three things. Number one, when Mary was visited by the angel Gabriel, if we were to look at the conversation that they had and the response that she gave, I would summarize it very simply. She was saying, I don't deserve this. This is overwhelming. And that means she understood 
grace. And then after the angel left, Mary was in a hurry to see her cousin Elizabeth because she in her mind said, I must tell someone. I can't keep this to myself. I mean, just like you, right? When you receive good news, do you keep it to yourself? When, I, when my son learned that my daughter-in-law was pregnant, the first thing he did was to tell me. Of course, he told his children too. The first time they saw the ultrasound of the baby, he sent me a picture of the ultrasound. We cannot keep good news to ourselves. And that's why you know, Mary needed to share the good news with somebody. And finally, at the end, we will hear what uh, is popularly known as the Magnificat. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that term. Some of you probably are. And there, Mary is basically saying, I will praise God always. And her example tells us that we should always live for the glory of God. So we're looking at grace, we're looking at good news, and we're looking at the God's glory. Okay, so that's our outline for today. Let's begin with the first one. I don't deserve this. She understood the meaning of grace. How can we learn that from the example of Mary? So let's look. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth. Background. Uh, Mary's cousin Elizabeth, by the way, please make sure you're back next Sunday. Pastor Peter will give us the next message in this Christmas series. And I believe he will explain what happened with uh, Zacharias, Elizabeth, the cousin of Mary, and Zacharias was also visited by the same angel. So many lessons to learn from that couple. But in the meantime, background, the, the angel said six months. Uh, that's because uh, Elizabeth was, was already on her six month of pregnancy. The angel Gabriel, some people may say, was the angel just, you know, a figment of Mary's imagination? Maybe she had too much pizza that night. Angels are all over the Bible. Old Testament and New Testament. Even the angel Gabriel, aside from the time he visited Mary and aside from the time he visited Zacharias in the temple, you also read about the angel Gabriel in Daniel, in the Old Testament. So angels have been around for a long, long, long time and I wouldn't be surprised if many of them are in this place right now. Because I believe angels are where God's presence is and God's presence is right here among his people. What an amazing thought. Anyway, a couple of important things. To a virgin engaged to a man, okay? So we know we're talking about Mary. What's the significance of virgin engaged to a man? And what's the significance of Joseph being a descendant of David? Okay, let me explain. Let me explain first about being engaged to a man. Today, uh, when you are engaged, you can, you know, break off the engagement and it will be sad, but, you know, it's really not a big deal, legally speaking. Uh, but during Mary's time and Joseph's time in Jewish tradition and law, when you were engaged, you were betrothed, you were practically husband and wife. In other words, you could only uh, cease the union through death or through divorce. The only thing that a betrothed couple did not do was live under the same roof and have physical intimacy. That's the only thing they didn't do. But they were as good as married. And in that culture, girls were betrothed as young as 12 or 13 years old. And that's why many commentators estimate Mary's age to have been between 13 and 17. Now, what is the significance of Joseph being a descendant of David? Okay, this is part of the prophecy about the Messiah. Jeremiah 23, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David, meaning from his line, a righteous branch, uh, meaning an offspring. And he will reign as king and act wisely and do justice and righteousness in the land. So this was a message of hope about this Messiah. And then it says, in his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell securely. No wonder people were looking forward to him, especially during Mary's time. And finally it says, 
And this is his name by which he will be called, the Lord our righteousness. The Lord our righteousness is one of the names of God in the Bible. It's attributed to the coming, well, at that time, the coming Messiah. Why is this name significant to us, to what we're talking about right now, about the whole aspect of grace? Notice what it says. The Lord is our righteousness. You see, for most people today, when they think of going to heaven, when they think of being acceptable before God, they usually, the default is, it's based on our own righteousness. It's based on how religious we are, how charitable we are, how good a person we are, how much we give to the poor, etc., etc., etc. But even in the Old Testament, we are already being told that when it comes to the Messiah, he is coming because we do not have the righteousness it takes to get to heaven. We could never depend on ourselves and justify ourselves telling God, I am a good enough person to be let into heaven. There is no such human being ever. Never will be. Not you, not me. Not even the nicest, humblest, sincere person. That's why you and I, in the eyes of God, we are spiritually bankrupt. Our spiritual bank balance in terms of getting into heaven is zero. No, it's like Gcash, zero, no balance. We need the righteousness of God through Jesus, the pure and holy righteousness and perfect righteousness of Jesus to be imputed, to be transferred, to be imputed into our spiritual bank account. And that is the only way, the only manner by which we can say, I'm sure of going to heaven because it has nothing to do with me, it has everything to do with the Messiah. That's grace. Are we clear so far? It will become clearer. Let's go back to the story. And coming in, he, the angel, said to her, greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was very perplexed at this statement and kept pondering what kind of salutation this was. The angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. What does this mean? Well, first of all, the apparition of an angel in the Bible is always scary because these are super beings. They're not at all like the angels you see in some artworks. You know, they're little chubby babies with little tiny wings. Angels do not look that way at all. I mean, if, if that little chubby thing appeared in front of me, I would not be afraid. I'd say, pwede bang kurutin or something, you know, but I wouldn't be afraid. But here, inevitably, not only in this case, when there's an angelic apparition, oftentimes, if not always, the opening line or among the opening lines is don't be afraid. Because Mary was. But the more important thing is this. Greetings, favored one. You have found favor with God. You see, folks, well, you and I know what's coming next, right? The angel said that, you know, you will bear the Messiah and so forth. So what's so important about understanding this word favor? From a human point of view, when you and I receive a special assignment, for example, at work, you are chosen uh, to undertake a special project. Usually it's because of your qualifications, right? Usually it's because of your track record. But in the case of grace, the theology of grace is such that when God chooses you or me, it is purely his sovereign choice. It has nothing to do with anything of our qualifications. That's why the word favor here is taken from the word Charis, which means grace or kindness. It had nothing to do with Mary qualifying for anything. And that's why she was so perplexed. And that's why we said in the end, her response is, why me, Lord? Who am I? I don't deserve this. 
And the nature of grace means it is to be granted or to be given. It is not earned. That is the nature of grace. The reason why I'm emphasizing this is because there are many people in this world and sincerely, with all sincerity in their heart, they believe that Mary was chosen because of a special reason, that she had no sin, that she was a perfect person. But folks, with all due respect, humility, sincerity, and love, we need to let you know that there is nothing in the Bible that said that about Mary. Absolutely nothing. And you know, that's why Mary becomes an even better example for you and me. Because if she's an ordinary person, just like you and just like me, then we do have hope in Jesus. We can learn from her example. So let's continue. Um, there's only one person who walked this earth who had no sin. Only one. What's his name? Only Jesus. How do we know? Well, first of all, in Romans 3.23, it's very clear. All have sinned. That word all in the original language, do you know what it means? It means all. Yeah, surprise. <laughs> all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's you and me and your grandmother and my grandfather and Mary and Joseph. And then it says in 1 Peter 2, referring to Jesus, Jesus who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And then it goes on to say in 1 John 3, you know that he, Jesus, appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. And in Hebrews chapter 4, it says, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one, Jesus, who has been tempted in all things as we are and yet without sin. Folks, only Jesus walked this earth and did not sin. All of the rest of us, including this amazing, humble, deeply spiritual young lady named Mary, we all need a savior. Towards the end of this message, you will hear from her own mouth Mary's admission that she too needed a savior. In the meantime, look at this quotation about grace from Hampton Keithley. The Greek word for grace is charis. Its basic idea is simply non-meritorious or unearned favor, an unearned gift, a favor or blessing bestowed as a gift, freely and never as merit for work performed. Grace is that which God does for mankind through his son, which mankind cannot earn, does not deserve, and will never merit. Is that clear enough for all of us? I think so. But I still believe the Bible is even clearer. Let me show you my absolute favorite passage when it comes to the clarity of salvation by grace through faith only. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Let's all read this together. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Grace, charis, we already know that. Gift, the meaning of the word gift is it is free. It is uncaused. In other words, we didn't do anything to deserve that gift. By the way, if you're here this afternoon and in your mind, okay, Christmas, in your mind, you're thinking, I deserve to receive a Christmas gift. Okay? If you are thinking, I deserve to receive a gift because it's Christmas, then there's, there's a term for that. It's called entitlement. We don't deserve to receive a gift just because it's Christmas. We'd like to. Some people will be kind enough to give us one, but we don't deserve it. That is the nature of gift. Are we clear? 
We're good? Okay. And the other meaning of the word gift, amazingly, in the original language is sacrifice. Why is eternal life a gift? Eternal life is something we cannot earn. It is given to us as a gift. A gift is given to you for free because if I gave that gift to you, I paid the price, right? Free to you, costly to me. Eternal life is a free gift to you and to me. Why? Because of the sacrifice of Jesus. Never by works, never by any action, never by any accomplishment that we may have to our name. Mary understood that. And that's why she was saying, I don't deserve this. But wait, there's more. Look at what the angel said. Remember, he didn't even say what he was there to do. He just said, hello, basically, you are favored. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. So it was very clear, even the name of the Messiah. Now, the, the name Jesus was in a way not a special name. There were many Jewish boys and men by the same name, Yeshua. That's the transliteration of the original name. And the name Yeshua, or where we also get Joshua, means to rescue, to deliver, and save. So it was kind of a macho name, you know, to name your boy Yeshua. Uh, it's something like today, you, if you want a macho name for your boy, you name him Hunter, right? It's a very macho name. So Jesus or Yeshua was also a macho name, a relatively common name, and that's why the Jesus we claim as Messiah had to be referred to as Jesus of Nazareth so that we don't confuse him with other Jesus says. Now, we know that the Jews were hoping to be liberated from Roman domination. But like we said, God had a much bigger plan for his son. And in Matthew 1.21, Joseph, who was almost about to divorce Mary when he discovered she was pregnant, he was told, no, 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 chill ka lang, pare. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. That was the mission of Jesus, not to liberate them from Roman domination. So Jesus did not come to save a nation from political domination at one point in history. He came to save from the dominion of sin anyone who would at any time put their faith in him as Lord and Savior. And that's true even today. And if you have not trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, this is the day to do that. And you will experience the same grace that Mary experienced 2,000 years ago. So let's go back to the story. Wow, angel Gabriel is not yet finished. He said, he, your son, Mary, he will be great and we be, will be called the son of the Most High. Most High means God. Son means the exact representation of God, meaning he is himself God. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. We already mentioned that. And he will reign over the house of Jacob, meaning he will be the king of Israel. He will be the king of the Jews. And this was so important. Do you remember King Herod? Remember when the wise men came and said, we're looking for the one who was born king of the Jews. And Herod got so angry. Why? Because he felt he was the king of the Jews. That was such an important position. Do you remember Pontius Pilate? when he turned over Jesus to be crucified. And he put a sign over Jesus' head, and that sign said, King of the Jews. And they were telling him, you know, you should put there, he claimed to be the King of the Jews. And Pilate said, I have written, what I have written, I have written. Jesus was King of Israel. But he was not an earthly king who would reign only for a certain number of years. It said here, his kingdom will have no end. So it was absolutely crystal clear from the words of the angel to Mary that this child will be God incarnate. With us is God, Emmanuel, Jesus, to rescue us from our sin. 
Now, in all of her innocence, Mary asks this, how can this be since I am a virgin? How can this be? Legitimate question. Legitimate answer. But let me tell you why it was so important to her. You see, before I read you this verse, obviously what was going on in Mary's mind was, what will, my, what will Joseph say? What will my family say? But more than that, it was a matter of life and death. Why? This is the reason. The Old Testament law. But if this charge is true that the girl was not found a virgin, that then they shall bring out the girl to the doorway of her father's house. Imagine how painful this would be. And the men of her city shall stone her to death because she has committed an act of folly in Israel by playing the harlot in her father's house. Thus you shall purge the evil from among you. So it's like Mary saying, wait a minute. This is, this is not some soap opera we're talking about here. This is my life. How will this be? Legitimate answer, the angel said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, the power of the Most High will overshadow you, and for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. Holy Child, set apart for God's purpose. In other words, the angel here is telling Mary, Mary, I have good news for you. This is how it's going to happen. It shall have nothing to do with you, you don't have to do anything. It certainly has nothing to do with Joseph. Joseph will not have to do anything. This will all be God's work. He will put his son through his Holy Spirit in you. It will be the work of the Holy Spirit of God. And that's why Jesus was holy and sinless because he was not subject to the sin nature that came from Adam. Jesus was purely the work of his heavenly father and Mary had the privilege of burying him within her womb. Now, even before Mary could say anything more, the angel said, you want more proof? <laughs> he said, even your relative Elizabeth has also conceived a son in her old age. And you know, people knew that Elizabeth was barren. She was not only super senior, even in her younger years, she didn't have children because she was barren. And that was the burden of her heart. So again, I won't preempt. Next Sunday, bring your family, bring your friends, bring your neighbors, bring your relatives, bring your enemies to listen to the message next Sunday, okay? But in the meantime, she is now in her sixth month. Why? For nothing will be impossible with God. You know, you may be here this afternoon and you're facing issues in your life. Maybe you don't know where your life is going. You're just existing day to day, but there is no clear purpose in your life. Well, let me tell you, my friend, if that's you, I want to echo the words of the angel. Nothing will be impossible with God. Why? Because Jesus is your sure hope. Now, if you know some, if you're already a follower of Jesus and uh, you're, you, know, you're, you're, you know someone who doesn't know Jesus yet and you say, you know, what is it going to take for this person to have his spiritual eyes opened and accept Jesus as his Lord and Savior? Let me echo the words of the angel also to you. Especially if you're a parent, you're wondering when your child will come to Christ, or you're a child, you're wondering when your parent or sibling will come to Christ, or your best friend or whatever. I echo those words again, nothing will be impossible with God. Now, finally, the angel is finished. What is Mary's response? Amazing. Mary said, behold, meaning here I am. Behold, the bond slave of the Lord. Bond slave is a special term. In the Old Testament, there was such a thing as slavery. Now, it's not the same as the slavery of, you know, like in the U.S., which led to the Civil War, but there was slavery in the Old Testament. Now, after seven years, a slave could go free. 
But that slave could also choose to remain serving his master or her master. And that slave would say, I do not want to be set free. I want to keep serving you because I am better off serving you than I am in the outside world. So I will serve you, my master, for the rest of my life. That is what you call a bond slave. And so here Mary voluntarily with all of the humility and sincerity in her heart, she's responding to the grace of God, knowing that she didn't do anything to deserve to be chosen. She's saying, I am your bond slave. May it be done to me according to your word. Do with my life whatever you want, Lord. And you know what? That's the point where we all need to come to in our lives. When we know that apart from the Messiah, we are nothing. And we come to him and we say, I want you to be my Lord. I am your bond slave for life. Do with my life what you will, Lord, because your plan for me will always be better than my plan for myself. And while Jesus came to live in Mary in a physical, biological sense, more importantly, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Jesus came to live within her in a spiritual sense. And that's what's true for you and for me. How many of you here in this room today, you absolutely believe that because you received Jesus as your Lord and Savior at one point in your life, Jesus, the Son of God, lives in you. How many of you believe that here today? Jesus, the Son of God, lives in you. This is not being poetic or melodramatic. This is a fact. The glorious Son of God, whose magnificent glory uh, inhabited the temple of Solomon so that people could not minister, that same glorious Messiah lives inside of you. Absolutely true, because the Bible tells us, I have been crucified with Christ. Again, I am the bond slave. Do with me what you will. My old life is gone. I've been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. It's true. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. Same idea as Mary said, do with me as thou wilt, O Lord, who loved me and gave himself for me. And more than that, in Ephesians, it also says, in him you also, after listening to the message of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you responded to the grace of God, you were sealed in him. What does sealed mean? Sealed means ownership. God says, I'm putting my stamp on, of ownership on you. You belong to me from this day forward. Isn't that amazing? And then it says, sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge. A pledge is a down payment. It's like real estate. You put down earnest money. I want this piece of land. This is now mine, and someday I'm gonna come back and complete the transaction. Jesus is saying, I paid with my life for you, and one of these days I'm gonna come back and bring you to be with me where I am. And finally it says, with a view to the redemption of God's own possession. What is redemption? Redemption is to release by payment of a ransom or to exchange. How many of us, ah, see si Pastor Ito, I'm sure he remembers this. How many of us here remember the days when, when we would drink soft drinks and then we would take the, the cap, the crown, and I don't know what the English word is, but we will make kut kut, and why will we make kut kut? Baka may free, right? And so we will take the crowns and then we will bring them where? Where will we, where will we bring them? Bien, where? The redemption center. We bring it to the redemption center because that's where we exchange the crowns for the prize. But in this case, it was Jesus who exchanged places with us. He took our place on that cruel cross because we could never pay for our sin. And that's why redemption is what it is. It's the exchange of Jesus in our place so that he could put his seal of ownership and one day he says, I'm coming back for you. Amazing. That's what grace is. (laughs) 
Do you remember this song? How many of you know this song? Isn't that grace? Not because of who I am, but because of what you've done. Not because of what I've done, Jesus, but because of who you are. I don't deserve this. This is grace. And the next one is I need to tell someone. That's good news. So, at this time, Mary arose, went in a hurry to the hill country, to the city of Judah, entered the house of Zacharias, and greeted her cousin. This was a long trip, maybe about 130 kilometers. And here is Mary now with her cousin telling her the good news. And you know what? They stayed together for three months. They had lots of notes to compare because uh, Elizabeth, again, through some miraculous work of God, was herself pregnant. So Mary needed to tell somebody. When Elizabeth, it says, heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb. Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she cried out with a loud voice and said, blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And how has it happened to me that the mother of my Lord, so even Elizabeth acknowledged that the Messiah was her Lord. And then she blessed Mary, and she blessed Jesus in her womb. And you know what? When you and I come to know Jesus personally as our Lord and Savior, uh, certainly other believers will be happy for us. And when we hear of someone coming to know Jesus, we should be happy for them. Just like the angels rejoice in heaven over one sinner who repents. I remember one of my old classmates from high school, we were so uh, hmm, misbehaved that we both at the same time almost got kicked out of high school because of pornography. The two of us. So that's how crazy we were. And then after high school, we parted ways. He went abroad. He became a believer in Jesus. I was not yet one. But when he heard that me, I, became a believer in Jesus, you know what he did? He literally knelt down and he said, Hallelujah, nothing is impossible with God because I became a believer. Now, More importantly than telling other believers about our newfound faith in Jesus is telling people who don't know about Jesus. For behold, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby leaped in my womb for joy, and blessed is she. Look at what Elizabeth told Mary. Blessed is she, meaning Mary, who believed that there will be a fulfillment of what had been spoken to her by the Lord. When you and I believe in grace, When you and I put our faith in Jesus, we are truly blessed. I remember one man, again, my classmate in high school, I did lots of crazy things in high school, okay? And this this man, today he's with CCF for many years, serving, discipling. But when we were in high school, uh, I corrupted him. And then many years later, when we were already professionals, I saw him, I was already a believer, I shared the gospel with him. And I discipled him every Saturday morning for a long time. But sometime down the road, he went to my wife, my late wife, and he said to her, you know what? In high school, before I met your husband, I was a good person. (laughs) But when he shared the gospel with me, I really listened to him. If it had been somebody else, I would not have listened. But I know what he was like before, and I could see that he was different now, and that's why I listened, and he became a believer. But it's not about me. It's about the grace of God. Now, going back to the amazing example of Mary, I want us to listen to the testimony of a young lady who, well, potentially could have led a very ordinary life, But God chose her in a very special way to serve him and to be used by him. Please welcome Kyla and be blessed by her story. Growing up in a Christian home, I learned at a very young age that I was a sinner in need of a savior so I can experience God's complete forgiveness of my sins and be assured of a place in heaven. 
I gave my life to Jesus at six years old. Early on, I was taught the principles of living by faith as a follower of Jesus. But I never thought that the seeds of faith planted in me were God's way of preparing me for a tough battle ahead. In my family, I am the sickly one. The hospital is my war zone. Before reaching 25 years old, I already had three surgeries. At seven, to remove a cyst on my leg. At 19, to take out half of my thyroid gland. And at 24, to extract my tonsils suspected of cancer. But by God's grace, the biopsy results of all the surgeries were benign. My medical challenges led me to seek God seriously. I began to pursue an intimate relationship with Him and sincerely prayed that He would relieve me of ongoing struggles. I prayed for a breakthrough. I dreamed of a good life with a successful career like my peers. However, at the peak of my youth, I did not have anything to show. I reached a point of emotional breakdown. I blamed myself and my past. I struggled with self-doubt and questioned God. However, God was not finished with me yet. At 27, I had my fourth surgery to remove some endometrial polyps which were causing me prolonged menstrual bleeding. Like the bleeding woman, I believed I could reach out to Jesus and be healed. But God wanted it differently. When I thought I was done with my operating room visits, God made me face an enemy far more dangerous than all my previous adversaries. In early December 2021, I was diagnosed with stage 3C1 endometrial clear cell carcinoma, otherwise known as womb cancer. Clear cell is a rare and fast killing cancer. It accounts for less than 5% of all endometrial cancers and mostly in mo postmenopausal women, not in young adults like me. It dawned on me that my time was running out. In my distress, I cried to God, why me, Lord? You said you have a plan for me, a plan not to harm me, a plan to give me hope and a future. But why cancer, Lord? And why does it have to be clear cell carcinoma? At the risk of cancer spreading, God wanted me to surrender my reproductive organs to Him. In my broken spirit, I had to return to my known battlefield for the fifth time. Within three weeks of diagnosis, I underwent the most complex and life-changing episode of my life, a total hysterectomy to remove all my reproductive organs. True to its aggressive nature, the cancer was found to have progressed to stage 4B, as it had already spread to my liver. I was devastated and felt utterly defeated. But God wanted me to view things from His perspective. I heard Him saying to me, Kyla, you may just be an ordinary person, but I have a special purpose for your life. This is when I came to realize what Proverbs 16 verse 9 means. A man's heart plans his course, but the Lord determines his steps. My cancer journey led me to experience Jesus more intimately. In my suffering, God is my comfort and refuge. He allowed me to find meaning in what I was going through. He taught me the divine art of comforting others. While battling my own cancer, God directed me to help other young adults who are fighting the same disease. Through the Life to the Max ministry, God led me to journey with Jana and Jasmine, two young women in their 20s with leukemia. Though I was sick myself, I was able to visit Jasmine in the hospital and talk with Jana in Cebu to share with them the message of God's love and gift of salvation. That journey was short but meaningful. Within just one year, both Jana and Jasmine went home to be with Jesus. 
God also led me to volunteer in a radio ministry called Anchor of Hope to share the gospel with cancer patients, their families, and the general public. I am also part of a community called Kaya, Cancer sa Adolescents and Young Adults, where as cancer patients, we support each other as we go through the challenges of experiencing cancer in our youth. At one time, I drove to Batangas to deliver donations to a five-year-old boy with cancer and shared the gospel with him and his family. At every opportunity, I would pray for my co-cancer patients in the hospital where I undergo immunotherapy. I was able to do all these because my God is able. Praise God. Cancer made me realize that earthly life is short. What the Lord wants of me is to focus on what is eternal. Every one of us will have our lives interrupted in one way or another, and we need to find a way to stand up again. We can only do this with God in our lives and with the support of our small group and the loving community. It's been two years since my diagnosis. As I continue the fight, I rest assured that God's grace is always sufficient. Without God and the prayers of my family of faith, I would not have endured five surgeries, six chemotherapy sessions, 27 immunotherapies, and still counting. Praise God. Despite the struggles, I will continue to trust God obey Him, and wait on what He has in store for me in His perfect time. Please pray for me as I continue my treatment, and for all the young adults like me, young children, and many others who are also bravely fighting cancer. I am Kyla Isabel Yaneza, a cancer warrior for Jesus. I believe all things will work together for my good in God's perfect time. To God be all the glory and praise. Thank you for listening. Hallelujah. We can do better than that. We are praising the Messiah who lives in Kaila. And whom we believe still has a perfect plan for her life. Shall we extend our hand of blessing and prayer toward Kaila? Lord Jesus, you are the sovereign God over all your creation. You are the Prince of Peace, everlasting Father, mighty God. You are God with us. And Lord, with one heart, we beseech you, we implore you, in the name that is above all names, your name, Jesus, that you will touch the body of Kyla as you cleansed her soul from sin completely by your blood, will you cleanse her body from cancer? Will you, Lord Jesus, for the glory of your name, work yet another miracle in her life by allowing her to be completely healed so that she can continue to bring the message of hope to many people for many, many more years. And in all humility, we echo what you said through your angel to Mary that day, for nothing shall be impossible with God. This we pray in your name, Jesus. Amen and amen. Thank you, Kyla. So let's move on to the end. I don't deserve this, that's grace. I must tell someone that's the good news. I will praise God always. This is how Mary uh, ended this part that we're uh, reading today. Mary said, my soul exalts the Lord. My spirit has rejoiced in God, my Savior. As I told you earlier, from the lips of Mary herself, we will hear her own testimony, her own admission, that she, being an ordinary human being like you and me, needs a savior, needed a savior. For he has had regard for the humble state of his bond slave, for behold, from this time, all generations will count me blessed. And then she goes on to say, the mighty one has done great things for me, and holy is his name. 
And then she shifts gears. She begins to speak about other people, not just about herself. And from the Old Testament, she quotes this. His mercy is upon generation after generation towards those who fear him. For those who have a proper view of God, that he is holy and will not tolerate sin, and yet he was benevolent and gracious enough to send his son because there's no other way to heaven. When we have a proper view of God, a proper view of ourselves that we need a savior and are helpless and hopeless without him, we will experience his mercy. And it will be true from one generation to the next. How does that happen? He has done mighty deeds with his arm, scattered those who were proud, brought down the rulers from their thrones, and at the end it says, sent away the rich empty-handed. Notice the verbs are in the past tense. But the reason why these verbs are in the past tense is because many times in, in biblical language, things that are prophesied about the future are expressed in the past tense because God's word, God's promises are so sure to happen, they can be expressed in the past tense as if they already happen. So how does this mercy of God, this grace of God work even today? Well, we read about scattering people who are proud, brought down from their thrones, meaning people who are haughty, proud, and arrogant, and sent away the rich empty-handed, letting people realize that they're spiritually bankrupt. Let me tell you quickly this story about a friend of mine who is now attending CCF. This friend of mine uh, was a happy-go-lucky young man once upon a time hopping from one school to the next, not caring if he even finished school or not. And of course, you know, uh, women and having a good time was his kind of thing. And then he got into drugs and he landed in jail for four years. Although he didn't know it was only for four years. He thought it would be maybe for many, many more years. In the jail, he experienced loneliness. Nobody visited him from his family. He experienced literal hunger. He would have to massage his fellow inmate to earn a few pesos to buy rice. And together with that rice, since nobody visited him, he would talk to the inmates who had visitors and said, can I have the ketchup of the fast food that your family brought for you? And that's what he would eat with his rice. But somebody told him about CCF. And he began to watch CCF videos even while he was in jail. And miraculously, after four years, somebody bailed him out. Up to this day, he cannot understand how that happened or why. It was all the grace of God. When he got out of jail, again, he continued to devour the word of God by watching more and more of the CCF videos. Today, he's actually here with me. I'm helping to mentor him. He's also being mentored by people in our jail ministry. And basically, he told me, with no in no uncertain terms, I have surrendered everything about my life to Jesus. He is my Lord and he is my Savior. And that's why we can say, he exalted those who are humble and he has filled the hungry with good things. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Finally, Mary said, he has given help to Israel, his servants, as he spoke to Abraham and his descendants forever. Again, past tense, but will happen in the future. It, uh, it happened in the past, yes, but we can be sure it will continue to happen in the future. So as we close, I know this whole thing that's happening in Israel and Hamas and so forth has deeply divided this world. Social media, rallies, pro, anti. But let me just say what the Bible says. In Genesis chapter 12, God told Abraham, I will make you into a great nation. Whoever blesses you, I will bless. Whoever curses you, I will curse. God's choosing of Israel was not because of anything they had done. It was purely his sovereign choice of grace. And you and I need to pray for the people of Israel so that their eyes will be opened and they, they will understand their need for a Messiah. 
But in Zechariah chapter 14, we are also told that one of these days, all the nations of the world will either turn against or turn away from Israel. And Israel will be left all by itself with no one to help. It will be a terrible time for them. But in the midst of that deep crisis, Jesus will come. He will come to Jerusalem. He will fight the final decisive battle and he will win and be victorious and reign on this earth forever. Why is that important to you and me today? Because Christmas tells us Jesus came the first time. But the Bible tells us Jesus will come again. And when he comes again, it says every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. For those of us who already put our faith in him, when he comes, it will just be a, an affirmation of what we already believe. But for those who have rejected Jesus, it will be a time of deep sorrow and deep regret because by that time, it will be too late. So if you're here today, I implore you in all humility, give your life to Jesus as your Lord and as your Savior. As our message says, receive Jesus, God's sure hope. And our applications are simply these. We must receive God's grace. We must share the good news. And we must always give God the glory. Shall we bow our heads together? And if you're here this afternoon, present or online, and you have never received the grace of God, then that grace has a name. His name is Jesus. If you've never received him into your life, if you've never come to a point where you say, Lord, you are my God, I am your bond slave, do with my life as you will, then will you do that right now? And tell him humbly, sincerely, Lord Jesus, I give you my life, I confess my need for you to be my Lord and Savior. I surrender to you completely from this day forward. Father, we thank you for the example of Mary and what we learn from her amazing example. Thank you, Lord, that she was just like us, people who need a Savior. But through her example of faith, humility, we know what we need to do if we have not yet given our lives to you. Lord Jesus, we give you all praise, all honor, and all thanksgiving in your name and all God's people said. Amen and amen. God bless you all. Good day, CCF family. Welcome to Sunday Fast Track, where you ask real life questions and we give you biblical truths. My name is Misha Valencia from CCF Communications, and we're here today with our speaker, Pastor Ricky Sartu, to answer some of your questions. Good day, Pastor Ricky. How are you today? Hi. Oh, I'm good. Thank you. That's great. So, uh, as the first question, we learn in the message today that God can use ordinary people for extraordinary things. Mm -hmm. Does the same apply to people who may not seem to be good people? For example, can God use criminals for his glory? And why would he? Okay. Um, first of all, let me say that it depends on your definition of good. Now, from a human point of view, some people are good, some people are semi-good, some people are totally bad, right? But the truth is, apart from God, none of us are really good meaning good enough to enter heaven, good enough to receive his salvation. So the truth is, um, God uses all kinds of people and reveals himself to all kinds of people. Now to your specific question about, what was your question? Can God use even a criminal yes. for his glory? Okay. Do you remember the thief on the cross? Was he a criminal? Yes. yes. Yeah. Uh, by his own admission, he said to his fellow criminal, he said, you and I were suffering the consequence of our action. Mm -hmm. So he was not framed. He was a real criminal. And yet, 
Before he let out his last breath, he said to Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Mm -hmm. And Jesus said to him, you will be with me today mm -hmm. in paradise. Mm -hmm. Up to this day, the Lord is using that criminal's life mm -hmm. for his glory and to teach us something. Mm -hmm. So can God use anybody and do an extraordinary thing in anybody's life? I think we know the answer, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Praise God for that answer. Yes, God can use anyone as long as we repent and really turn to Him, right? Yeah. There. Okay, so for our second question, some Christians watching today may feel like their lives are anything but extraordinary. What comfort and encouragement does God's story and Mary have for them? Well, I believe that the encouragement we have from Mary is the fact that she was really an ordinary person. I have no doubt that she was a wonderful person mm -hmm. and I have a tremendous degree of respect for her, although we don't know a whole lot about her, mm -hmm. but I know that she was very spiritual, very contemplative, very humble. But her encouragement to us is that God uses ordinary people like her. Mm -hmm. By her own admission, she needed a savior and she even came from a from a nothing town, you know, mm -hmm. one of the would-be disciples once said about Nazareth, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Mm -hmm. So if you feel like you are anything but extraordinary, well, Mary would say to you, welcome to the club. Look at what God did for me and with me. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just uh, trust God and just tell him, whatever you want for my life, Lord, mm -hmm. I will accept, I will rejoice, and I will follow. And then the extraordinary begins to happen. Mm -hmm. well, praise God. That's such an encouragement for people who feel ordinary, but it is really God who, who really makes us extraordinary, right? So the last question, it was clear from today's message that we do not deserve grace. Mm -hmm. But what about the opposite? Do we deserve the bad things that happen to us? Okay, do you have three hours for the answer? <laughs> Probably not. No, but uh, it really depends on what these bad things are. Mm -hmm. Some of the bad things that happen to us are things of our own doing. They are consequences of very poor decisions and even disobedience to God. Now, some things, some bad things that happen to us, we have no clue where they come from. And this is where the sovereignty of God comes in. Whether the bad things that happen to us are of our own doing or they are not, we know that God is a redeeming God and He can cause all things, all things, to work together for good for those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. Now, you and I need to understand what that good means. And that good doesn't necessarily mean that the happy end, you know, it'll always be a happy ending, but it will certainly lead us to become more and more like Jesus because mm -hmm. that is God's ultimate desire and plan for all of us. Wow. Please, God, thank you for answering our questions, sure. Pastor Ricky. So, but before we go, IDC or Intentional Discipleship Conference is coming next year, mm -hmm. January 25 yeah. to 27. And we have exciting plenary speakers and workshops in store for you. Mm -hmm. You can now purchase your tickets at the ground floor lobby here at the CCF Center or via idc.org.ph. And that's it for CCF Sunday Fast Track. God bless everyone! <laughs>